There we go, it came in. There has to be some problem with every video broadcast, otherwise are you even having fun? It's been two and a half years of this, we all know the tricks. Um, my name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, we are the virtual adventure partner of the Toronto Zoo and over the last two years we've had the chance to partner with them on over 30 broadcasts showcasing the amazing work that they do to conserve and care for wildlife and animals there with the general public. So if you wanna check out all of those programs like our 2,500 other past programs here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, they are all on our YouTube channel. Now, I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, but if you are new to this, welcome in. We've got groups joining us on YouTube, uh, both for the Toronto Zoo and us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and our Facebook friends at the Toronto Zoo. So welcome in to all of you, and thank you for spending part of your afternoon with us today as we get to showcase and celebrate such a cool topic. Now, today we are diving in with nutrition at the Toronto Zoo as a part of our joint broadcast series between the zoo team and the amazing folks at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. So we've had a chance to do a couple other programs over the last few months. I hope you get the chance to check them out when you're done this broadcast. But today we're going to learn about how they feed animals at the zoo, how they make sure they get strong and healthy. We're going to learn about feeding animals generally and some of the work that goes into that. And we're going to hear some very cool research from Michelle Wadzak in a few minutes as well. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our friends Mary Ellen and Morgan at the zoo to dive in and get uh, all the excitement going. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys, and take us away. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. We're so excited to have you here today to be learning about animal nutrition and some of the amazing animals who call the zoo their home. Now, before we get started today, I'm going to have Jesse bring up our land acknowledgement, and we're going to read that before we get started today with our program. So we'd like to acknowledge that the land that we are standing on is the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. Thank you, Jesse, for that. So welcome everybody. We are here today to learn all about animal nutrition, what they like to eat, how they're eating it, why they're eating it, why do we feed them that, how does that differ from them in the wild? So many amazing questions are being asked today and hopefully we'll be able to answer all of them. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn the camera around here. I know you don't wanna be looking at me anymore. And we are going to meet our special live guest star here behind us. Let me just turn our camera and get this program started. All right, everybody. So welcome to the Rainforest Pavilion. And I'd like to introduce you to our pygmy hippopotamus. So we actually have three pygmy hippos here at the Toronto Zoo. We have our youngest, Penelope. We have her mother, Candia. And for a special appearance, you know, we weren't going to feature him today necessarily. But if you can see through the mesh in the back there, uh, Candia is kind of checking somebody out back there. That is Harvey. And he is our male pygmy hippo. Now, hippos are a very interesting species because this probably isn't the type of hippo that you think of when I say the word hippo. You're probably thinking of the really big ones who live out in the savanna. And if you've ever seen the movie Madagascar, Gloria, she's a river hippo and they are much, much bigger. But when you think about where they actually live, it makes sense that these ones are so much tinier. Now, don't get me wrong. The two girls in front of us here probably both weigh upwards of 300 pounds. So they're definitely a large creature still, but not nearly as big as a river hippo out on the savanna. But that's because they have to contend with something that a river hippo doesn't have to, and that is lots and lots of trees. So they live in the rainforest where there's lots of trees that they have to move around and walk around. Now in their exhibit right now, I think we're gonna have a few more snacks tossed in for them actually, which is great. Uh, but you can see they're eating lots of hay on the ground. Now I'm gonna actually hold up something kind of cool here. And if you've been watching our videos with us for a while now, you might actually recognize this skull. I believe I used it in a program last year when we talked all about our biofacts here at the Toronto Zoo. Now this is a pygmy hippo skull. Pretty impressive, right? And the really cool thing is here, we can open it up and take a look at their teeth. And this can tell us a lot about their nutrition. So you can actually tell what an animal likes to eat based on their teeth. And hippos are kind of cool. They follow that 
also have some other sneaky advantages. So when you're looking at a skull, or if you're feeling in your own mouth with your own tongue, feel at the back of your mouth for your molars, your flat teeth. Those are the ones right here. And those are the ones that help us to eat and plant matter. Then if you're feeling around the front of your mouth, like here, those are your teeth that help you to chew and rip things, like if you're eating more of a meat material. And you're gonna look and you're gonna say, Mary Ellen, this hippo has some pretty sharp teeth in the front of their mouth. Does that mean they're a carnivore? No, hippos are herbivores. So they are just eating vegetation. They use their big sharp teeth for another, uh, another reason. Do we wanna maybe try and guess right now? Let's see in the, in the polls, in the chats, Flood Jesse with all your guesses. What do you think pygmy hippos use their sharp teeth for if it's not for eating? Mm, all right, folks. Again, uh, you guys want to be tr pricking the trigger finger in all our channels today. Let us know what we think those big teeth are for. You've been pretty active so far in the chat. StreamYard classes, if you want to type in in the chat as well. We'd love to hear from you guys. we got more or veggies. Yes, we know that. That's good. Any thoughts on the big sharp teeth? Maybe vampirism? I don't know. Self-defense? Great answer. Okay, from our Facebook friends. Let's see what's coming in on the private chat here. Protect... Protection and self-defense is like our universal answer coming in. Is that correct? That is exactly very good. So hippos, because they are a uh, herbivore animal, that means they're a prey species as well. So anything else can kind of eat them or come along and attack, but they also like their own space. So they're using those big teeth to defend from other hippos trying to take over their home or from any predators nearby. Now our lovely keepers here have just tossed in um, some vegetation for them. So it looks like they've got a very healthy lunchtime snack of some uh, lettuce or kale here, it looks like. Uh, and they're eating that up very happily. And we also put some snacks into this blue bucket here. And you might think, Mary Ellen, that doesn't look very natural. Why do you have a blue bucket in their exhibit? And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a teaser here. That's an enrichment item. And if you tune in next month, to our video with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We're gonna talk all about enrichments, what they are, why we give them to animals, and how you can actually help our animals around the holiday season to get more enrichment as well. All right, so we're talking about our hippos and what they're eating. Now, if you don't know, here we are later on different from the real African savanna and African rainforest, kind of a bit of a, a plain journey away. So how do we make sure that our animals here are getting the right food that they need to keep them healthy and strong and uh, give them all the nutrients that they need? Well, we have a wonderful nutrition team who Morgan's going to teach us a little bit about in just a second. But we also have an amazing horticulture team here at the Toronto Zoo as well. And I always love to be able to promote all of our different departments and how we're able to work together here at the zoo. Now, if we walk around the inside here a little bit, we can see all these different types of plants. And these plants here are ones that would not survive outside here in Canada, especially in the winter. It's quite chilly out today. But these are all plants that can be found in Africa. And our horticulture team takes really good care of them. And this is incredible for us for two reasons. One, when you're actually in these buildings, looking at these animals from other areas of the world, you feel like you're transported to that area and it feels more authentic for the people. But two, it means that we can grow their favorite snacks that they would have out in the wild here at the zoo and we're able to provide that for them, which is great for their health and for their nutrition science. All right, let's learn a little bit more about our nutrition team. So I've got my friend Morgan with me here and she is going to teach us all about our nutrition team. Take it away, Morgan. Hey, hi everyone. So like Mary Ellen said, my name is Morgan and I work for our whole wildlife science department, which is really great because I get to learn all about the different sciences here at the zoo. So today I'm going to talk about one science that's intertwined with all the other sciences, which is nutrition science. So first, in order to tell you a bit about the science that nutrition team does, I want to give you a little behind the scenes tour of what our nutrition department looks like. 
So Jesse's actually going to play a video for you of our department there. So as you can see, this is one of our main areas of our nutrition department. We're walking into a big freezer now, so a little bit bigger than the freezers you have at home. We have a lot of animals to feed. We actually have a total of, I believe, six freezers. So that's a lot of food storage, a lot of uh, food to store for our very, very large animals. This is another little area that kind of looks like a grocery store. So this is all, you'll see some peanut butter there that's used for a nice high value treat. So this meal prep happens every single day from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. at the zoo. So what our team will do is they'll prepare these meals in order to, for them to be ready for the next day. This is some of our gels. These are really highly packed with a bunch of nutritional value. And these are some extra supplements. So just like we might take our vitamins in the morning, this is some extra supplements to help our animals. So I'm sorry if you're a little grossed out by this, but our carnivores like our lions and our tigers need some meat. So this is our Toronto Zoo patent carnivore diet. So you'll see that package there. That whole diet was made and created by the Toronto Zoo. And lots of big bins. Of course, we need all of this food to go out to the animals. It can't just stay in this nutrition department. So all of those bins get sent out to the animals. So at six in the morning, those bins will be all packed up with food. They'll get loaded up on a big truck and our truck will come deliver them out. And then you can see our animals get the deliveries and it's spread throughout the day. So this is our tiger cub, Mila. She's a little bit bigger now. She's now over a year old. So she, it's harder to tell her between her mom now, but this is Mila and Maisie. This is a good example of some of the bowls that they do use. And some of our raccoons. You'll recognize these guys maybe from your dumpsters, but here we uh, give them food in a little bit of a different way than a tr trash can. Great, and our polar bears. So I was really excited to include some polar bear footage in this video because polar bear research is one of the biggest projects that the nutrition team is working on right now. The polar bears are really, really tough to study their diet in the wild because many factors go into their diet. They also change their diet depending on what month or what season it is. So I'll let you watch this polar bear a little bit longer and then I'm gonna tell you more about the project. So just loving life there. Perfect, so I'm gonna actually bring you back to me, Jesse, if we don't mind closing. All right, awesome. So I hope you enjoyed that video. The Nutrition Center is one of the most exciting little behind the scenes here at the zoo. So to bring you back to that polar bear research, what we're trying to figure out is compare the nutrition studies here at the zoo so we can learn more about the polar bears out in the wild. So what this project is, is a three-step project. So the first step was a behavioral study. We wanted to watch the polar bears and see how they're spending their time. So I'll show you a little chart here. We had a researcher actually watch them for an hour a day in the summer where we, whoops, in the summer, there we go, where we learned that they spent a large part of the hour being inactive. So they just kind of hung out, laid in the sun, slept under a rock. Whereas compared to the winter in February, they spent most of that hour being active. So you'll see the green there. They were wandering around more, maybe playing, swimming, those types of things. So that really helped us figure out how much energy they're spending at the, during their day at what time of the year, which allowed us to then go to the second part of this study, which is where we tested their blood. So you might think that doesn't sound like nutrition, but we use nutrition items to get the blood samples. So you can see here, this is our polar bear Hudson getting a high value treat and offering up his paw for a blood sample. So this allowed it to be a voluntary experience for our polar bear because they got a really yummy snack from it, but also giving us the important information we needed. By taking their blood and looking at the different values in their blood, 
we could actually see the energy requirements that were in their blood at different times of the year. Then it leads us to our third part, which was probably the grossest part. We needed to check their internal temperatures. This could allow us to see, did they change their temperature depending on how much energy they're using? So what they did, they put a thermometer in a great big meatball and they fed our polar bears a meatball. This allowed the thermometer to go all the way through their system, out the other end, and researchers had to find those thermometers within the polar bear poop, so you can imagine how gross that would be. They had to dig through, find those thermometers, and it was loaded with a bunch of temperature data. So that was overall the three different steps of the study, and it is allowing us to, to find out tons of information about what our bears need different times of the year. I'll really quickly touch on a couple other projects before I throw it back. Perfect, so we'll go back to the hippo so you can watch them while I'm talking a little bit about the research. Another project that we do here at the zoo is to focus on diets during hibernation. It's really important for our animals to be well fed and have the nutritional values they need in order to go on hibernation. So if you've ever heard of a Vancouver Island marmot, they have a lot of difficulties with their heart while they hibernate. So it's up to the nutrition team to find really nutritional, nutritional value packed foods that can support their heart while they're hibernating. Another really important project and very similar to hippos is giraffes. Giraffes have a certain chamber in their stomach that absorbs all the nutrients. So we actually test the stuff that's in that part of the stomach to see how much nutrients they are absorbing. And the very last one is the carnivore diet. You guys saw the carnivore diet in that video. So that diet was actually made in 1995. So that was probably lots of years before many of you were born. But the Toronto Zoo created this carnivore diet. And we now actually sell this diet to over 60 zoos in all over North America. So we took our expertise and our research and we are now able to help zoos all over North America feed this diet that is perfectly balanced and created to support the carnivores. So I'll stop boring you with all this research, all of this to say that nutrition is not just the food that you see put in front of these animals. A lot of this goes in, a lot of research goes into what they need and how we can help support them just like they would be supported in the wild. Very, very cool, Morgan. And by the way, not boring as at all. We've got folks in South Carolina, North Carolina, all the Carolinas. There might be others we don't know yet. Uh, England, all over Canada and beyond who are absolutely loving this on Facebook. So thank you so much for that deep dive in there. And what we'll do now is continue the trend of a little bit more research, talking in with Michelle, who's going to talk to us about nutrition in animal studies. So uh, Michelle, welcoming in at University of Toronto Scarborough campus as part of this special series. We'll say farewell to our Zoom team for a little bit before bringing them back for Q&A. But welcome to the broadcast for your first time ever. This is so exciting to have you today. Yes, thank you so much for having me, guys. So I just want to forewarn that I do not have videos of really cute zoo animals, but <laughs> hopefully this is an educational uh, talk for you guys. So I'm at the University of Toronto Scarborough. I'm the Varium director there. Uh, I'm also a, a veterinary technologist. Um, so basically, in my role, I ensure that all animals that are taking part in any sort of animal study are uh, treated with the highest standard of care. We're located uh, off the Rouge Valley, uh, which is quite close to the Toronto Zoo, and so we have a lot of collaborations with the Toronto Zoo. Uh, so let's go into uh, nutrition and just talking about uh, it as it applies to uh, animals that are part of animal studies. So. For a bit of background, animal studies can take part out in the wild, so we call that field research. And typically this is us observing the animals in their natural environment. However, depending on what we're studying, we may have a question that needs to be studied in a controlled environment. And so when that's the case, we do those studies at accredited institutions. So the Toronto Zoo is one of those institutions and University of Toronto as well. Um, we're accredited with the Canadian Council on Animal Care and uh, the Ontario Ministry of Food and Agriculture. There's a wide range of areas of study um, that we take part in at the university, 
But just to give you guys some examples, we have um, people that are out in the wild studying animal, animal conservation. So how can we protect animals out in uh, their natural environment? Uh, we also have studies underway where we're studying the impacts of climate change on animal behavior and physiology. So for example, um, CO2 depositing in the water, how does that uh, change in pH to the water potentially impact fish behavior and their ability to smell? So these are really important things for us to be able to protect them. And then also just other basic science sort of areas of study. So immunology, neuroscience, genetics, and nutrition. So for some background for you guys, so research really is the systematic investigation of something. The way that we typically go about that, we have a question. Uh, uh, so basically we have a hypothesis where we uh, have a, um, what we suspect might happen under a certain condition. We study that. We analyze the data, we draw conclusions. One of the most basic principles is that when we are doing these studies is that we control everything other than what we are studying. So we call those external variables. We don't want anything else essentially changing so that we know that what we're studying is in fact uh, related uh, to what we're changing. So with that in mind, let's jump into nutrition. So nutrition is all of the steps involved with taking food and turning it into body elements. So that's chewing your food, that's uh, breaking down the food with enzymes and chemical digestion, that's absorbing the food, turning it into those elements, um, and uh, also having some of that food uh, be excreted as feces. Um, proper nutrition is critical for normal development and function. So as basic as our genes, uh, uh, basically um, the enzyme sort of reactions, uh, muscle and bone formation, and then how our organs work. So how our brain work, is working, how uh, our digestive system is, is going up about its normal functions. So proper nutrition requires a careful balance of nutrients. So the building blocks of food, uh, and these are species specific. So uh, the folks at the Toronto Zoo already talked to this a little bit where you know, there's some animals that are carnivores, so they're eating meat, animals that are omnivores, eating both um, meat and veggies. And so their needs uh, vary um, between these species and their needs. But ultimately, the main sort of uh, components that are involved and in, in, in the building blocks of food are the same. And so that includes things like protein, so amino acids, lipids, fats and oils, carbohydrates such as sugars and fibers, vitamins and minerals. And we typically group these into two uh, major um, areas such as macronutrients and micronutrients. So micronutrients being what we don't need a lot, uh, don't need a lot in quantity. So for example, vitamins and uh, minerals, uh, and then macronutrients, which are the uh, items that we typically use to fuel our body in large quantities. So proteins and carbs and, and lipids. So how can diet impact uh, our biology or, or, or us? And I provided a couple examples here. These are in no way uh, uh, the only ones, but just to say that if we restrict, so if we limit the amount of food that we are providing, so for example, in mice, we know that if we provide them a certain amount of food every day, that we can uh, increase their life expectancy up to 50% if we control that. Uh, however, if you provide too much food, so excess calories, uh, we get the opposite sort of thing. We can get obesity, we can get cancers and degenerative diseases that occur sooner and more seriously. Uh, so with, with more sort of advanced disease. We can also have nutritional deficiencies that can impact how our body organs form our tissues and even behavior. We know that a zinc deficiency, for example, in humans and in rodents uh, can bring about behavior that's similar to depression. And then nutrient contamination. So how our food is grown, uh, there could be natural plant hormones or pesticides uh, that can lead to changes in growth rates and or cancers. So with that all being said, it's just to say that it's important that when we are providing diets to animals that are being used in science, that we want that these are standardized. We want to know that what we're studying is in fact related to the study and not due to improper diet. And we also want to be able to reproduce that study, perhaps to be able to add on to that, um, that knowledge that we've learned. So in the past, many years ago, animals were fed food waste. 
Uh, this was pretty common in agriculture as well, though I'm sure there are still a few farms doing this. It's not a good source of diet for the animals. So here we have some pigs that are being fed, um, some bagels and donuts. Although they're tasty, their diet is likely to be unbalanced. Um, source of contamination and disease. So salmonella parasites. We've really come a long way. And today we have standardized diets for animals. These are based on all the scientific literature we've collected to date and it's species specific. So essentially, uh, these diets are typically a formulated in pelleted form, um, but of course, depending on the needs of that animal, if, if they need liquid, then that is how it would be provided. But if they were to take any bite of this food, it would be a well-balanced ba diet. Um, so on the left-hand side here, we see um, some chicks. They're being provided with pelleted feed that's uh, well-balanced for them. And you've probably seen this in pet stores as well with your animals. It's costly, uh, but it is thoroughly tested, it's reproducible, and it ensures the animal welfare and high quality science. So nutritional needs do change based on the age and activity level of the animal. So for example, um, higher proteins and fats are required for pregnant and lactating. So moms that are producing milk, they're burning energy much faster, uh, as well as young animals, they're growing very rapidly, uh, doubling in size relatively quickly. So we have special formulations uh, for these animals during these critical times. You may have seen these at pet stores. There's puppy formulations and adult formulations. And we do the same if we are uh, for any of our animals that are part of study. So for our rodents, uh, we offer them um, uh, breeder diets and we have prenatal supplements and things of that sort. I wanted to provide a couple other examples of some animals that are used in studies. Um, so zebra fish uh, are one particular type of fish that we use um, and just studied um, a variety of different um, conditions. They're really interesting in that they're a vertebrate animal, um, but uh, so just they have a lot of the same sort of uh, organs and everything as us uh, and other animals. However, they are developing out in the water. So their embryos are not inside the mom, but they grow out in the water and they're completely transparent. So they're clear. So we can see that embryo developing completely non-invasively. We can uh, put them under a microscope and very uh, uh, accurately um, or detailed look at all of the, the cells uh, that are going on um, and we can do this both in the embryos and we can do this uh, in larvae and in young zebra fish as well. Um, and so here are just some photos of them growing. And to talk about some of the diets that we offer them. So uh, when they're very young, we do offer them live feed. Uh, so zooplankton, single celled ciliates. Uh, and there's a, a zoom here on the right hand side of some brine shrimp. So these are shrimp that we feed to them. Uh, they're great because it's a source of environmental enrichment. I've already heard that word said today, uh, but essentially they can go after the live feed. Um, and uh, and yeah, we do know that because uh, this is live feed, we're growing it, that there could be variation batch to batch. We do have standard protocols in place to try and minimize that, but we do recognize that that can occur because it's not a pelleted or, or flake diet. Zebrafish dry diets have come a long way, so we do have them developed. Um, they're available in different sizes based on the fish age. So once they're a little bit older, we do uh, feed them this in combination with live feed. So this diet here is available in 100 microns in size, so just bigger than a red blood cell, up to 400 microns um, based on uh, their age. We can precisely deliver this to them uh, using some tools like this. Uh, that we calibrate based on the number of fish that might be in a tank. Um, these, this diet is very expensive at $130 a, a tiny bag, but it ensures high quality science uh, and it contains um, marine proteins, algae, phospholipids, and vitamins for them. And then another animal uh, that I want to talk about that we have some studies underway out in the wild and in controlled studies uh, is uh, the hummingbird. So, we have studies underway to try and understand how they are metabolizing sugars um, because they are a metabolic marvel. They burn energy super, super fast, uh, more than any other bird or mammal. Um, their wings beat 50 times a second. Heart is beating about a thousand times a minute. And they need to feed every 10 to 15 minutes to meet up, uh, to make up for uh, those energy needs. At night, they go into a hibernation-like state known as torpor, 
to conserve energy so that they do not die because if they did not have access to feed, um, yeah, that would likely occur. So if we do have hummingbirds in captivity, uh, it's critical that we carefully monitor how much feed they are consuming. So we can actually do this quite precisely with um, the use of syringes. So at any time we can see how much they've consumed. Um, and we do have specialized diets um, that contain high quality proteins and sugars for them. Um, because sugar can grow mold, we have very strict uh, husbandry practices in place. So cleaning of the syringes and replacing those uh, on a daily basis. And so if there's anything you guys are to take back from this talk, it's just to say that if you do have any hummingbird feeders out in your backyard, just make sure to routinely uh, clean those, ideally anytime you're feeding them so that you're not making the birds sick. So clean them and thoroughly rinse them. So lastly, I just did want to talk about uh, that we do have treats like the Toronto Zoo was showing in their videos. Uh, we, we call these uh, food enrichments. They're certified. Um, these are typically tailored to be species specific. So for mice, for example, they like to forage and to dig. So we have a lot of treats like that. Uh, and actually next month, uh, the focus of the talk will be enrichment. So if you're interested in that, please uh, tune in. My colleague, Christine McCall, will be talking about that. So thank you for having me. And uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Michelle. And by the way, I wish I had hummingbirds coming to my place. I've moved recently and I don't know if we even had hummingbirds where I am, but, but I'll, I'll put out a good feeder and we'll see how it goes from there. And I love your adorable picture of a mouse to wrap up the broadcast as well. Um, folks, what we're going to do is take questions now for everyone. If you have questions for the zoo team, if you have questions for Michelle about her research and the work that we talked about at UTSC today, uh, by all means, I'm going to head to our live classes with us first. But if you are joining us on YouTube or Facebook, please feel free to share in the chat. We'd love to take as many as humanly possible. So, uh, Ms. McTiernan's class, if you guys want to unmute your mic, turn on your camera, I'll come to you in a minute, but Ms. Ross's class is all queued up, so I'm going to head to them first for a question. Welcome in, in Davis Doc guys, and take us away. Hey, everybody. Uh, my question is, how old, how do you know how old the animals are? Yeah, uh, so is this at the zoo or just in general when you're doing work with them? Like doing work with them. Yeah. Michelle, I'll, I'll head to you one for that one first, and then we'll head to the zoo team as well. How do you know how old these animals are you're working with? Sure. So it varies species to species, but for hummingbirds, uh, there's striations on their beak. And so we utilize, we, we look at that to see if they're, um, if they're quite young or if they're uh, an older aged hummingbird. But ultimately, we have date of births, hopefully, um, but it depends on, on the species. Excellent. And then at the zoo, our friends there, what do you guys think? That's a great question. So just kind of like Michelle was saying, there's a few different ways to tell. Uh, for an animal here like Penelope, she was born here. So we know her exact date, time, like down to the second how old she is. Uh, for other animals, we can actually look at their teeth typically. So animals, because they use their teeth to survive and eat, uh, if the teeth are really worn down or older, uh, or kind of uh, looking in disrepair, it typically indicates an older animal uh, or for some animals as well, how big they get. So as they get bigger, that means they're getting older as well. So kind of a, a difference. We do have some tortoises here at the zoo that we are unsure of how old they are. We think they're around 60 and that's based on the growth patterns of their shell. Fantastic. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Um, all right, we're going to head to Ms. Siemens' class, joining us in lovely Miami, Florida. If you guys have a question for us, come on in. Hey, guys. Um, how many different types of species are, are, are polar bears? How many types of species are, sorry about the polar bears? Could you repeat that? How Louder. How many different types of species are, 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 are polar bears? I'm really sorry. I'm not catching that bet. I'm catching how many species and then about polar bears. <laughs> how many species of polar bears are there? Oh, are there, is there more than one kind of polar bear, Mary Ellen? Or just one? Gotcha. There we go. So there's only one type of polar bear, but there are lots of different types of bears. So there's polar bears, there's grizzly bears, there's black bears. And I guess if we're technically just going by the bear name, there's also like uh, like a giant panda bear or a red panda bear, even though they're not as closely uh, related in that kind of bear sense. But we can lump them into it for this today. 
Yes, for the purposes of a random bear question, we can throw them in. I encourage our classes, look up something called a spectacle bear. You will not be disappointed. Or a sun bear. These are bears that most people don't know about. Certainly aren't in the public eye quite as much, but are very, very special creatures. Uh, Mr. Margaret Class, joining us in Sudbury. If you guys have a question for us, come on in. Um, have you ever run out of food? And what would you do if you ran out of food? Great question. Mary Ellen. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take this one. So we have luckily never run out of food here at the zoo. I think we would have some very angry animals on our hands. So we get shipments of food in three times a week. And we are always ensuring that we have over the amount of food that we need. That, so that would never happen. During um, the pandemic, when the zoo was shut down, we had to source food from different areas. But we also get shipments of food from all the way from China if a certain animal needs food that's coming from there. So we are very prepared from all the different shipments that we get. That is very comforting to hear. Uh, we got some great questions from our, our folks online. We'll head back to our live classes in just a minute as well. Uh, but Miss Alexander wants to know, how many times uh, does the polar bear's temperature get taken when the thermometer travels through? So you talked about this uh, special thermometer meatball. What's going on with that? Is it taking it every second or how does it work? That is a really great question. So what the thermometer actually does is it takes averages of their temperatures through different times of the day. I believe it was every three to four hours and then it would average them out. So we kind of had a daily temperature rather than an hourly or minute, that kind of thing. Very, very cool. Now we've uh, got our photo here on our pygmy hippo and yet you guys have mentioned polar bears, so this is on you. We are now in the full polar bear question extravaganza. Um, Arkham in Miss Eccles' class wants to know what the polar bears eat specifically. We showed some tiger food there, but no polar bear stuff. I love it. So yeah, so they're eating a very different diet than our pygmy hippos here in front of us. Our polar bears here at the Toronto Zoo, we actually try really hard to make sure that all of the food that they're eating as well is from sustainable sources. And that's because they eat a lot of fish. So they are a seafood sustainable uh, certified animal. So I believe they're getting herring, uh, smelt, and we actually buy those in bulk once a year. And then we keep them in a really large uh, freezer and then bring it into the zoo as much as we need. But polar bears do eat a lot of vegetation. So as Morgan was saying, their energy levels change through their year, their temperature levels change, but so does their diet. So in the uh, spring and kind of like uh, uh, summer months, they're eating a lot of vegetation like lettuce, apple, carrots. And at Halloween time, we also give them uh, pumpkins, which is my favorite time because mm. they're white in color and pumpkins are so brightly orange. It actually stains their fur for a little bit and they look quite interesting with a red face and paws. It looks like they've been up to some um, maybe not so legal activities when that mm. happens. <laughs> <laughs> There's an image to go home with, kids. Um, I'm going to head back to our live classes for a minute. We'll take some more from YouTube. Time flies and you're having fun. We are nearing the end of the broadcast. Um, Miss True Love, Miss McTiernan, if you guys want to share questions in the chat too, we'd love to hear from you guys. But let's head back to Miss Ross's class with the student right at the camera. Hi. Have you got hurt while trying to feed any of the animals? Yeah, good question. Did you catch that, Ariel? Really Morgan? Good. Yep. Sorry. Yep. That's a really great question. So our keepers are really well trained to only feed them in different ways that are really safe. So a lot of the times they don't actually enter the area where the animals are fed. So if you come during feeding time, you'll actually get to see the lions being thrown their food. So a keeper will stand on the outside and throw in some of their food items or they'll put in the food when they're cleaning the enclosures. So what they would do is transfer the animal off exhibit, then a keeper would go onto the exhibit when it's safe, place their food in different areas, and then transfer the animal back onto site. So it's all done really safely. Great question, guys. All right, Miss True Love's class, thanks for sharing in the chat. They've got a question that's also been echoed by one on YouTube, so I'm going to bring in both at the same time here. Miss True Love's class wants to know, how do you know what the animals want to do? And uh, our, our question online is royalty coming from Miss Eccles' class wants to know, how did the scientists figure out what they like to eat? So how do you intuit what a pygmy hippo wants to do and eat? Guys? That's a, a great question. And honestly, it kind of is really well related to what we are talking about today 
about all the interconnectedness and everything that goes into the nutritional science of animals. So it's not just one person. Morgan was mentioning that our polar bears got behavior studies done. For somebody's job is to stand there and watch them and write down everything they did in a day. We do that with all of our animals here at the zoo, and there's plenty of researchers who do that in the wild as well, where their whole job is to sit for weeks at a time and take notes on what an animal's doing. Did it get up and move around? Was it super active? Was it sleeping? Did it go to the bathroom? Did it swim? Did it climb? All sorts of things. They write it all down, and we can use that to help us determine what they want to do. So, for example, here for the pygmy hippos, we have a wallow set up over here, which is basically just a mud puddle uh, in human terms, but they think it's much fun than much more fun than that. And it's actually set up next to Harvey. And so that's because we've noticed that Candia and Harvey are wanting to say hi to each other so they can hang out there. If I pan over to the right, you can see that their pool was cleaned earlier today and it's being refilled for them to go swimming. So there's lots of activities for them. They do have enrichments in here that the keepers will string up and move around to keep things interesting. And for they just do more saying of the rat. They have special spots of their stomach that tell them what they digest. And also their teeth can tell us what they like to eat. And again, just watching them in the wild and seeing how they react to things around them. Great. I, I honestly I thought being a human was pretty great, but being a pygmy hippo sounds like the absolute life. What a good time. Uh, we're gonna take three more questions, folks. So Miss Siemens Class, I'm heading back to Miami. Mr. Mark Rick, I'll come to you in a second, and we've got some great questions from YouTube as well. So Miss Hey. Um, yeah. um, hey. How much food does the polar bear eat? Um, how much pounds does the polar bear eat per day? Per day, the polar bear. <laughs> per day, okay. So do you remember in the video, there was those big bins that we saw. So I don't have an exact weight on how much food that they eat, but we fill basically a bin that's the size of a medium sized cardboard box. So they get one of those whole bins full of um, different veggies and fish and all those other foods that Mary Ellen talked about. They get one of those bins a day per polar bear. So, yeah. Our American friends are coming up on Thanksgiving where classically they eat an entire cardboard box of food as well during the weekend. Uh, so <laughs> we, we're very familiar with this. Um, Mr. Marcus class, I'm coming to you guys live and I'll take a few quick ones from our, our friends online before we wrap up. But Sudbury, welcome in. Um, how many different types of species? Uh, um, how many different species are hippos? Like how many types? Yeah, how many types of hippos are there, guys? Yeah, so we mentioned here these are our pygmy hip. Uh, oh my goodness, sorry, our pygmy hippos, or I sometimes call them house hippos. If you remember that commercial from the early two thousands, I might be dating myself a little bit there. Um, and then we also have hippos. There's types. Oh, we cut out a little bit there, but we've got our two main types, right, Mary Ellen? We've got our river and our pygmy hippos? Correct, yes. Good. <laughs> okay, sorry that the connection's given us a little bit of trouble. But by the way, the house hippo commercial is the greatest commercial in the history of commercials. Any student who hasn't seen it should look it up on YouTube when you're done this broadcast. Uh, Michelle, I've got a question for you from one of our friends on Facebook. So they wanted to know specifically, do hummingbirds eat things beside nectar to get their proteins and their fat? So I'll bring you back in for this. Yeah, so uh, so they do primarily consume uh, nectar from plants, but they do also consume the the odd insect, and so that's why if we do have them in captivity, we make sure that that diet is balanced and has the proteins to make up for potential uh, sort of insects uh, and also uh, the sugars that they need. Fantastic yeah. Good question, guys. Um, Mary Ellen Morgan, I hope we're going to be able to get the connection through for this one, but I love this question from Renee to wrap up. Uh, we're going to uh, bring this on screen here, but her children are six and ten. They love zoology and body. Those are my favorite topics growing up as well. Are there any volunteer opportunities at the zoo for them? Hmm. There are lots of ways to get involved with the zoo. I will say six and ten might be on the slight young side for us to be a true volunteer here at the zoo but please keep up the energy and the excitement for that there's lots you can do to come on site and see the animals and when you're in high school you can actually become a zoo ambassador 
and there there are lots of opt-outs there, and you even get to do lots of programming the way that Morgan and I are doing today as well. So there's lots of ways to help out and visit the animals. Fantastic. Mary Ellen, that is a great piece of advice. I can say as someone who volunteered at the zoo myself when I was in high school, it was one of my favorite things I ever did on the path to becoming a science communicator. So I hope your kids get the chance to do that. For any people that are looking for more resources on zoology, botany, any of the topics that we feature at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, you can always email us uh, on the link below. Uh, we'd be happy to find some great ideas for you to keep the excitement going after these broadcasts are done. Now, Mary Ellen and Morgan are very used to this. I'm going to bring them back in and bring in Michelle as well. But what we do to wrap up every broadcast is first of all say a huge thank you to you both uh, all three of you for joining in today sharing these amazing zoo stories some incredible research being done at U of T and more this has been such a special series over the last few months and our audience has absolutely loved it today and what we do to wrap up broadcast is the best possible thing to wrap up broadcast I'm going to bring in all our teacher friends to say a big thank you and farewell so Miss McTiernan Miss Seaman Miss Ross Miss <laughs>